the elite in this country are practically criminal. I mean, we're overdue to, to everybody to accept the fact that these people are only doing what's in their interest and not the rest of us, and they've turned their back on us. And, and the sooner we accept that, the sooner we start working to kick them out of their power. Above ground, you have the U.S. declaring for democracy, saying Aristide is our man. Underground, you have U.S. government employees slaughtering the constituents of Aristide. And behind closed doors, the U.S. negotiator saying to Aristide, you know, we got a problem here with all these uh, uh, terrorist killings. The only way to stop this is for you to move our way. The decline of the middle class, which is the basis for democracy. And he's saying that we're, we're, the middle class is eroding because we're having such wide disparity in, in, in income levels. And we're looking more and more like Latin America. Uh, the banana republics, where we have the institutions of democracy, like Mexico, we have all the institutions, then they're all a farce. You're going to end up dealing with the same folks as before, the five families that run the country, the military and the bourgeoisie. The revolt of the elite, of course, is the, the title would, would have you think. It is that they are reneging on not only the social contract, but all the other arrangements that, that leadership is supposed to provide. And they're not providing leadership anymore because they have abdicated any responsibility for the United States. Ruling elites and their institutions dominate our lives, no matter what political system we live under. We're going to look at two countries, Haiti and the United States, in this regard right now on Alternative Views. The United States has been dominating Haiti for many years and has worked assiduously over the years to prevent any type of popular leader coming to power who could present a challenge to the U.S. hegemony and commercial operations. We will see how the United States has a combination of finessed and coerced Aristide into doing the bidding of the United States. We'll also, with Dr. Jack Hopper, take a look at the American elites and review Christopher Lash's book, Revolt of the Elites. This will be preceded by our section on Haiti, which will have presentations by a popular Haitian leader, an American journalist who is very familiar with Haiti, and one of the country's outstanding intellectuals, Noam Chomsky. But before we have our interview and our presentation on Haiti, here are some news stories which we've gleaned for you from the alternative press. There is a small little article uh, written by the uh, editor of Extra, and it's about the single-payer health plan, such as they have in, uh, um, in up in Canada. He said the mainstream media have just been dismissing this plan, even though it's been introduced in Congress, the McDermott Wellstone single player proposal, is there, the mainstream media say, well, it's politically unrealistic, and they're not even talking about it. But the people in FAIR, the Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, have examples both personal and corporate which show how the single payer system would actually benefit the American people. Uh, using them as an example, for instance, uh, the company last year, FAIR, paid 39000 over $39,000 in medical premiums for their private insurance company to cover 10 employees. But because in, these insurance premiums have ridden so much in the past few years, they can't afford to cover half-time employees. But under the single-payer national health insurance uh, plan, FAIR would pay no private 
premiums, but instead a 4% tax on their total payroll of uh, $307,000. Now, this health tax would have amounted to $12,280. So that means that they would have saved $26,975 last year because they paid $39,000 in premiums, whereas the tax for the single-payer system would have been a little over $12,000. And then the editor says his family of three paid $732 in 1973 uh, to medical practitioners, and deductibles, co-payments, and costs not covered by insurance. 732 But if they'd had the single-payer system with a 2.1% uh, income tax, uh, uh, to finance it, the tax would have come to $495 compared to the $732 they paid in all these non-covered uh, costs. And the publisher who gave birth uh, in 1993, her family of three paid out more than $2,000 in deductibles, co-payments, and uncovered costs. But under the single-payer plan, they would have had to pay only $585 in tax. So the, the mathematics is there. The single-payer system is much better for the total American people, but it's not good for the insurance companies, and they're the people who buy the politicians. The federal government's capitulation to the timber industry on the pretext of protecting jobs has resulted in increasing criticism and a wave of rallies of thousands of people protesting the government's decision to grant wood chipping licences in Australia's last old growth forest. Poll after poll affirms that Australians by and large want the remaining strands of old growth forest protected. The Herald McNair poll released in mid-February revealed that nearly half the population want export wood chipping phased out by the year 2000 and a sizeable proportion of those were concerned about timber workers' jobs. This sentiment and the rallies for the forest puts increasing pressure on the government and the timber companies, both of whom have put out a lot of misinformation. But the real issue in the wood chipping debate is whether the timber companies will continue to receive the hundreds of millions of dollars in government subsidies. The timber companies are able to meet the demand for wood chips from plantation timber but they do not do so only because they are being subsidised to destroy irreplaceable old growth forests. This means that they are presently making profits well and above the average business rate due mainly to these subsidies and to access to the forests. And profits are particularly high at the moment due to the high price for wood chipping due to its current short supply. Subsidies to the timber companies from the various state governments is shrouded in secrecy. These subsidies could be diverted into more socially useful areas for society and for the retaining and employment for those workers in the industry. There's a story in the New Republic that indicates that the Christian right hasn't been as successful as either they make out to be or their enemies make out to be. That indicates that the Christian conservatives really have a losing record on all the big issues that they have pushed over the last uh, 12 years or so. They've been very big for separation against, separation of church and state, and arguing that the American system is a Christian one, that we should have more religion in uh, politics, we should do away with the separation between church and state, and so forth. But in all the major court decisions, even with the Reagan-Bush conservative Supreme Court, they've gone against the religious right on this issue, reaffirming the separation of church and state. For instance, in 1992, the Rehnquist Court went a step beyond even the Warren Court and ruled that a non-sectarian invocation by a reform rabbi at a high school graduation violated the First Amendment. In fact, in the 15 years since the moral majority began attacking the separation of church and state, Christian conservatives have managed to poke only one brick out of the wall separating church and state, which is a 1984 opinion by Warren Berger permitting Christian crutches on public property so long as they were accompanied by Frosty the Snowman or other secular seasonal symbols. So they really haven't had much influence on this issue. 
The other issue that the Christian right has been concerned with is high school curricula. You've seen a lot on TV how they're going to, for the teaching of creationism. They're attacking secularism in the textbooks. They're trying to get more religion in uh, school creationism and other uh, doctrines. But in point of fact, the school systems have, if anything, according to David Frum, gone more towards secular education and away from religious uh, education. Most of the textbook publishers, Frum indicates, have tried to avoid the controversy simply by eliminating religion altogether from the uh, textbooks that are in public schools. So rather than more religion, as the Christian right wants, there's been less religion in uh, public schools, in part because of their own um, influence and their own creating of uh, controversy. They've been, of course, for things like uh, creationism, but the major trend in uh, public schools in recent years has been more hard science and less religion like creationism, so they've also lost on uh, this issue. Obscenity has been another concern for the Christian right, attacking pornography, attacking U.S. support through the National Endowment of the Arts for gay photography, for instance, or anything that involves sexuality of any kind of an explicit nature. But despite these campaigns, there's been more explicit pornography in the mainstream of American culture than any time in history. Any hotel in the United States, you can, practically any hotel, you can get pornographic uh, movies pay per uh, view. Likewise, on home uh, satellite channels, there's uh, pornographic uh, movies. There's pornographic stores in every um, town in the United States, uh, practically. And as for the National Endowment for the Arts, all of the artists that were attacked by Jesse Helms and the Christian right are funded by the more recent National Endowment for the Arts back on the public payroll. So the Christian right has had no influence on uh, this issue. Abortion has been perhaps one of the most fanatical concerns of the Christian right, but abortion retains its status as a constitutional right despite the campaign of the Christian right against this issue. Moreover, more and more people are favoring abortion today, if you look at the polls, than at any time in history. And recently, in well-publicized TV show discussions, Barbara Bush and Nancy Reagan have come out indicating that one of their major disagreements with their husbands was over the issue of abortion. So even the moderate Republicans are turning around on this issue with it's been a big defeat for the uh, Christian right. Finally, on the issue of gay rights, the big campaigns for for cutting back on gay rights and attacking and stigmatizing gays have also backfired, where both in Supreme Court uh, and other court uh, decisions, gays have made advances in getting their rights legally secured. So this has been another uh, defeat. David Frome indicates that the reason that one has the impression that these people are more successful than they really are is that the Christian right itself plays up every little uh, victory that they do for fundraising purposes and to promote themselves. And a lot of their enemies, like the, um, that is this group that Norman uh, Lear is um, involved with, the people for the American Way and the ACLU and many other uh, groups that have been opposing the Christian right send out these fundraising letters that sort of hysterically indicate that the Christian right is a big threat to send money to the uh, liberals that are fighting them. So both the enemies and the Christian right itself seem to be blowing up out of proportion their power. And they've really been on a losing uh, role on uh, most of the big issues that they've uh, politicized. Now let's look at elites. First in Haiti, as explained by a journalist, a distinguished professor, and a popular leader in Haiti. The motive force behind the U.S. policy has been the fear of a popular movement, the fear of the population organizing and stepping forward and seizing control of Haitian society and the Haitian government. Take the case of the Duvaliers, 
For many years, the Duvaliers were favored clients of Washington. U.S. Marine missions came in to train the Tonton Makuts. The CIA came in to train uh, the Makuts. Washington was happy with the Duvaliers, but in late 85, early 86, as popular movements started to surge, it looked like they were losing, it looked like Baby Doc was losing its grip. The U.S. decided, this looks too dangerous. It's time to go. We have to ease them out. Colonel Stephen Butler, who was the U.S. Pentagon official in charge of military planning for the Caribbean at the time, explained that they feared that if Baby Doc stayed in, they would have a popular uprising on their hands. So the alternative was to move him out, bring in another military group. Now, the military officers who the U.S. supported in the, the coup that ousted Baby Doc were actually engaged in running cocaine into the United States, as Butler explained. He also explained that the U.S. had known for a number of years that Baby Doc himself was running cocaine in the United States. U.S. radar in the, in the, in the Dominican Republic had actually spotted planes taking off uh, from one of uh, Baby Doc's farms uh, flying the drugs into the U.S. But none of that had been sufficient reason for the U.S. to pull the plug on him. That reason only came when it looked like he was losing his repressive force and the U.S. might be facing the, facing the danger of an actual popular uprising in Haiti. And they opted to replace him not with a popular force, but with another group of criminals, a group of criminals who it seemed to Washington could maintain control. Now, in this period, there was a certain chaos on the political scene. Popular groups were coming forward on every front. The old Tonton Makut apparatus was in disrepair. So it was at this moment that the CIA stepped in to launch the SIN, while the U.S. Congress had ostensibly, legally and above board, cut off U.S. military aid to Haiti. A group that terrorized Haitian dissidents engaged in surveillance on a national scale. It wasn't enough, though. It wasn't enough to crush the Haitian popular movement, which continued to grow in force. In 1990, Washington decided that to stabilize the situation, it would make more sense to have a legitimate elected president. Mark Bazan was the U.S. candidate. The U.S. sponsored elections. At the last moment, though, the popular movement, completely confounding the plans of the U.S. Embassy, put forward Aristide as the candidate. He swept to victory before the U.S. knew what had happened. And within weeks, Colonel Collins from the embassy was approaching Emmanuel Constant, saying, we need a force. We need a force to counterbalance the popular movement, to counterbalance Aristide. This was what became the terrorist frap. The U.S. on paper was opposed to this regime. They supposedly wanted them to leave but they kept paying those who were directing the terror. They kept paying those who were overseeing the terror and simultaneously were using that terror to twist the arm of Aristide. The uh, economic failures of, uh, of the Aristide regime were in fact described in a secret February 1992 U.S. Embassy cable which reported the leaked but then suppressed recorded the surprisingly successful efforts of the Aristide government, which were quick, quickly reversed by the coup. Uh, that, um, that was also, the same thing was reported by the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, as it described how Aristide's successes during the 17 months, in their words, were welcomed by the international financial community, which therefore gave him substantial assistance, further frightening Washington, incidentally, uh, but that's, of course, the wrong story, so that's not part of history. In Washington, Aristide was being given a set of conditions. The U.S. saw that it had a problem with the coup regime. The coup regime was not consolidating control. They were not succeeding in obliterating the popular movement. Haiti remained unstable. Investors did not want to come in. Refugees were still fleeing to Florida, creating political problems for the Democrats in Florida who hoped to hold on uh, to that state as they finally did in the elections uh, after, the, uh, after it was clear that Aristide, uh, after the return of Aristide. The U.S. realized at a point that they had to bring Aristide back. 
That was the only way to stop the flow of refugees. That was the only way to stabilize the situation. But with, a, with conditions. They wanted Aristide without the old Aristide platform. Aristide without the popular movement. Lawrence Pizzullo, the former U.S. envoy to Haiti, explained to me that in their negotiations with Aristide, they used the terror of the frap. Pizzullo, who was Clinton's point man until he was forced out because he, had, he was getting a little embarrassing. He was lying too outrageously to Congress and they had to get rid of him. Uh, but he remained an expert for the New York Times. And he explains that Aristide failed politically while in office uh, because he was unwilling to broaden his political base that is beyond the huge majority of the population uh, to include uh, those, the elite of intelligence and training, uh, the, what are called in the, in the West the middle classes, which refers to 1% of the population. And he didn't broaden his base to them properly. He uh, didn't have the right people in power. Uh, the, uh, uh, he, uh, the other problem he faced was his estrangement from the elected parliament coupled with his chilly relationship uh, with the uh, leading uh, element, with the uh, political and military leaders that led, to, that's what, what led to his overthrow. So obviously pretty bad character, but of course, what can you expect in a country with no democratic traditions? Uh, only a, a vibrant, lively civil society of grassroots movements that had uh, come out from nowhere and had offered the population a chance to participate in local affairs and even national affairs, as America's Watch put it, uh, something that caused outright horror here, uh, the hatred for democracy in the United States among the educated classes is, uh, again, has to be watched to be believed. As for the elected parliament that uh, Aristide couldn't get along with, uh, they were elected, indeed, because the popular movements didn't have the resources uh, to challenge the traditional wealthy and military middle classes, that 1%, uh, so therefore they were indeed elected. Uh, and uh, now the, uh, the, pro the, the, what the president must do is to bring back the business and the military and put them in power. Uh, so that then civil society will be uh, 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 will be uh, back functioning in the proper way. Now, Pizzullo denied any knowledge of the U.S. connection to the FRAP, but he said that in October of '93, as the killing was rising, uh, uh, the FRAP terror was rising to its peak. The U.S. sat Aristide down and said, "Look, the FRAP has now become the dominant force on the ground. The only way to counteract that." is for you to join with us and move to the right, bring old Duvalier elements uh, into, your, uh, into your government. I mean, think about that. Think about the cynicism of that. Above ground, you have the U.S. declaring for democracy, saying Aristide is our man. Underground, you have U.S. government employees slaughtering the constituents of Aristide. And behind closed doors, the U.S. negotiator saying to Aristide, you know, we got a problem here with all these uh, uh, terrorist killings. The only way to stop this is for you to move our way. Uh, what is part of history is that once Aristide was brought to Washington, uh, he was civilized. He had been what was called a, 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 a demagogue, a, a rabble rouser, a, a terrorist, a gangster, an ideologue. Uh, he had even tried to raise the minimum, minimum wage and interfered with market forces. Uh, but while in Washington, he got civilized. So as his strongest supporters put it, put it I'm not talking about his critics, but his strongest supporters, uh, he was given a crash course in democracy and capitalism. Uh, the uh, leading commentator in the New York Times, Elaine Shalino, uh, said that the Clinton administration really worked hard force-feeding him with a dose of economics and public administration. Most importantly, signing on to a World Bank IMF structural readjustment plan, which, if finally implemented, would probably be the most radical ever attempted anywhere in the world, involving a whole range of measures from laying off half of government employees to privatizing all significant uh, state enterprises, 
creating special uh, parallel courts that would be more favorable to corporations, uh, direct subsidies to export uh, corporations, laying aside the old agenda of dramatic increases in the minimum wage, redistribution of land, redistribution of wealth, overturning the table of exploitation, and so forth. Aristide signed on to that program. The U.S. brought him back. Coup d'état de septembre là, c'est un coup d'état qui était fait justement parce que dans la politique États-Unis, question participation peuple dans les affaires politiques, c'est un bagage qui pas d'accord. The coup d'état was carried out because, frankly, with regards to U.S. policy, the question of popular participation in determining the affairs of a country is something that they do not look upon favorably. Et ça, c'est pas seulement en Haïti. Euh, dès qu'il y a une élection, dans quel que soit le pays en Amérique latine, c'est toujours une élection contrôlée, une élection manipulée. And throughout the hemisphere, when there are elections that are held, there are always elections that are controlled and manipulated. Et tu as gagné un pile discussion, un pile confusion, et le peuple a été tellement absouffri. Il y a un pile de monde dans le peuple haïtien, haïtien qui a vécu ici aux États-Unis, qui était ouais, et débarquement ça, et comme bon Dieu qui t'a descendu, à le sauver le peuple haïtien. There was a lot of debate going on because there was so much suffering that the Haitian people were facing that there was a lot of debate going on and even within the Haitian community in the United States many people saw the arrival of US troops as though it was the uh, the second arrival of Christ. Et dans le pays a un pile monde t'attend que les soldats américains ont été débarqués ont après craser ses draps, craser frappe, craser toute force qui était fait coup d'état. And people expected that when the U.S. went into Haiti, they were going to take out Cédras, Francois, and dismantle all of the repressive forces. Mais au lieu que c'est crasé, ils ont été vins crasés, ils ont été protection, ils ont été vins bas. But instead of coming to crush them, what they've come is to give them protection. Et c'est en bas protection et forçaio, Cédras a le joui millions et millions de dollars ils ont volé dans caisse l'État. Fait dans drogue et la and it's with their protection that Cedras has gone off happily to enjoy the millions and millions of dollars that he stole from the Haitian people, from the Haitian treasury, and they, that he made off activities such as drug running. The uh, people thought that the frappe qui was a creation of the CIA, but quand même, they were able to kill the frappe, and protection for Sayo. Constant a conférence de presse. And people thought, even though FRAP is actually creation of the CIA, people got it into their heads that perhaps they would come to crush FRAP. But Emmanuel Constant, when he gave his press conference, it was with U.S. security that he did it. So, objectif et un pile monde parle, il relève sa occupation et il dit c'est un appui à la démocratie, ces forces multinationales. Bon, quand nous relève and many people even have trouble with the word occupation. They say, well, it's some kind of support that's being given uh, for democracy in Haiti, or it's multinational forces, peacekeeping forces. But we have to call a spade a spade or a cat a cat. What it is is an occupation. Occupation, ça, il y a deux objectifs fondamentaux. And this occupation has two fundamental objectives. Yon c'est réaliser objectif coup d'état qui c'est éliminer masse populaire sur scène politique là. One of them is to carry out the objective or to realize the objective of the coup itself which is to eliminate popular participation in the political agenda in the political arena. Deuxième objectif fondamental là c'est implanter projet économique néolibéral là dans pays d'Haïti. And the second objective is to put Firmly in place a neoliberal economic model in Haiti. Non, six mois ça a été passé là. Principal aide communauté internationale la bail à le joindre de groupes qui a travaillé, nous t'as dit contre gouvernement Aristide. 
And in the past six months, the aid which has come from the international community into Haiti has gone to support groups which are in opposition to President Aristide. Et l'on a parlé de économie politique néolibérale. Là, par exemple, c'est rivé privatiser toute entreprise l'État dans le pays d'Haïti. And when we speak of the neoliberal model in Haiti, what they're talking about, for example, is the privatization of all of the state enterprises. Par exemple, si nous prenons entreprise de coût téléco, eh bien, c'est un bagage qui rapporte au pays à environ 50-60 millions de dollars par année. And if we take, for example, Teleco, the telephone company, this enterprise, which is owned by the state, brings in profits of 50 to 60 million dollars a year into the state coffers. Et ça, c'est malgré tout le vol qui est là-dedans. S'il t'a bien organisé, il a rapporté presque 100 millions de dollars. And that's given all of the uh, corruption that's happening within it. If it were cleaned up and uh, correctly managed, it could bring 100 million. Et l'argent, ça, c'est l'argent qui est capable de servir pour créer l'école. Parce que j'y joue, j'y joue, il y a plus de 1 million de personnes dans le pays d'Haïti qui parlent de l'école. And that money could be used, for example, to build schools. Because today, there are about a million children which have no access to schooling. Gagnant, euh, 75% de la population qui est analphabète, ça a créé un programme d'alphabétisation. And with an illiteracy rate of 75%, this money could go toward a literacy campaign. And now you have a situation where in the countryside in Haiti, as a result of an order that came down from, through the U.S. military chain of command in October of 1994, where the U.S. Special Forces are collaborating directly with the FRAP, as Amy mentioned, with that example. This is not the initiative of individual Special Forces units. This is policy from Washington. It's not just that the paramilitaries have not been disarmed. The paramilitaries have been politically aided and abetted and protected by the U.S. occupation forces. The night of Aristide's uh, return, we went over to the Army General Staff Headquarters uh, just across the street uh, from the palace in Port-au-Prince. And we're up there standing on the balcony talking to a, a young Haitian-American uh, U.S. soldier who had left Haiti when he was young and had now uh, returned with the U.S. troops. And we were looking out at the crowds of people in the street. And he said, you know, if we weren't here, if we weren't here to protect this building, they'd burn this place down. This, uh, this, this building would be cinders. This army would disappear overnight. He knew very well from his own experience and from the people who he had been talking to who the U.S. troops were protecting. Major Lewis Kernison, who was Colonel Pat Collins' assistant in the Defense Intelligence Agency office in Port-au-Prince, and who was then put in charge of the police training programs in Haiti, uh, he explained it to me this way. This was right before the occupation. This is the way he, uh, he said, um, uh, who are we going back to save? You're going to end up dealing with the same folks as before, the five families that run the country, the military and the bourgeoisie. They're the same folks that are supposed to be the bad guys now, but the bottom line is you know that you're always going to end up dealing with them. It's not going to be the, sl the slum guy from Cité Soleil. The best thing he can f hope for is probably, oh, I'll help you offload your cargo truck, because that's all he has the capacity to do. It'll be the same elites, the bourgeoisie, and the five families that run the country. That was Kernison right before the occupation. As it's played out, it has worked out that way. Now you have Aristide back, but coming out of Aristide's mouth is the economic program of Mark Bazan the World Bank IMF structural readjustment, even more radical than that which Bazan had ever dared to propose. So, the plan is to make Haiti a vast market to make American American products, so that we don't need to make any products anymore. The United States has to make any products anymore. And the idea is to turn Haiti into a vast marketplace where, for example, we wouldn't need to produce our food anymore because the United States would just send it. And we would be there just to sell our labor, to sell 
our sweat in factories for, as the Haitian people put it, potato skin, for just nothing. And we know this is the last thing that you ever want to give anyone control over is your stomach. Because when they control your stomach, they can pull you wherever they want. Well, you've seen how the big elites help keep the little elites in power to the benefit of both and the harm to common people. Now let's take a closer look at the big elites in the United States. We've done a lot of programs and parts of programs over the years with our economic consultant, Jack Hopper. We've talked a lot about, naturally, since he has a doctorate in economics, that's what we've talked a lot about, but economics in relationship to society. And we've also talked a lot, of, a lot about books which have come out in the past uh, couple of years or so, very significant books like America, What Went Wrong, uh, indicating uh, what uh, economically and socially and politically are really significant problems in the United States today. Well, we have another book to discuss, and it is also extremely illuminating. It's by Christopher Lash. His last book actually was uh, published uh, posthumously, and it is about the revolt of the elites. Well, Jack, this sounds on the face of it a little bit like what we were talking about previously before this book even came out uh, a couple years ago about the elites who run the country or the ruling class uh, destroying the social compact or social contract which they'd had uh, with us in the past where they would give us enough crumbs where we could have a decent life uh, if so long as we left the system alone and let them run it to their benefit but that they are not doing that anymore and the country is suffering. Is this what the revolt of the elites is about? Well, the revolt of the elite, of course, is the, the title would, would have you think. It is that they are reneging on not only the social contract, but all the other arrangements that, that leadership is supposed to provide. And they're not providing leadership anymore because they have abdicated any responsibility for the United States. These people don't care anymore about the country. They certainly don't care anything about the community or any of the communities that they've, they've been a participant in. And uh, now it's all global. Money can go uh, worldwide and these people can go worldwide. Jobs can go that way. And uh, so they look on everything in terms of, of national, uh, international. And what that means is there is no national. By definition, if everything is international, then they don't have to worry about anything less than that. Hmm. So I guess we can see where GATT with the World Trade Organization and NAFTA and the it attempts to uh, strengthen the UN, even provide the UN uh, per perhaps with a tax base and with a standing army. These are just uh, developments which they're working toward uh, to try to uh, uh, implement this global new world order. Is this part of what uh, they're talking about here in this book? Well, uh, they, of course, they don't get that. Uh, Lash doesn't talk about economics too much other than to say that, that part of the, real, the serious problem is monetizing everything. Everything is in terms of money. The, all of the values are, are disappearing. But the example of us immediately, quickly, and expensively bailing Mexico out of its own jam down there indicates the, the interest these people have in international affairs far uh, exceeding those of domestic affairs. Uh, we've seen over the years the deterioration of the American middle class and the continued uh, uh, d degree, increasing degree of poverty and uh, enormous numbers of people who've been thrown into poverty and people who are only able to work uh, to have some type of a middle-class standard of living by working two jobs or having at least two incomes in the family. Is this part of the globalization that he is talking about and the uh, impoverishment of the ordinary American citizen? Is this part of the plan? Well, he, he asked the question, does democracy uh, have a future? And does it deserve to have a future? And what he's looking at is the decline of the middle class, which is the basis for democracy. And he's saying that we're, we're, 
the middle class is eroding because we're having such wide disparity in, in, in income levels. And we're looking more and more like Latin America. Uh, the banana republics, where we have the institutions of democracy, like Mexico, we have all the institutions, then they're all a farce because we have mostly poor people and rich people who are suppressing all the poor people. And that's the way this country is giving every indication of going. Now, we've done uh, programs on alternative views on the American power structure. In fact, we had a two-part series where we went very uh, uh, much in detail in the American power structure. And we've seen that this uh, power structure and ruling class has been in control for decades, or even since, actually, if you want to go back to the start of the uh, Constitution, it was these same people uh, who made the Constitution. Uh, but this change that uh, Lash is talking about uh, is fairly recent, isn't it? Well, it's recent in, in a sense. I think our awareness of it is more recent. Uh, it really began in post-World War II when things began to happen, when the, the, the American system began to move out across the world, uh, when we took on the communist menace and kind of became internationalized. And then we had the, the multinational corporations. And now the elite is composed to a large extent of corporate flunkies, high-level employees, CEOs and whatnot, a lot of whom have been overseas and back to the point where the corporation doesn't know what boundaries mean, and these people don't either, and don't care. Mm -hmm. And so this has been taking place over a long period of time, but I think uh, the, the effect of it politically and, and uh, in other ways is just, just now beginning to show up. Well, wasn't didn't it really accelerated under the uh, Reagan-Bush administrations, and I guess perhaps starting in, in Carter's where uh, with the extreme globalization of the economy, plus with the same time the uh, impoverishment of the uh, American middle class. Well, I, th I think you could go back to uh, the 70s, maybe, maybe even to Watergate, and uh, see some attitudes there of, of a lot of this kind of thing. And uh, it, just, it just hadn't begun to, to accelerate, maybe, uh, until the 80s when uh, you, you saw the, the whole notion of wealth and flaunting wealth becoming uh, the thing to do. And you saw the, the early the process by which the uh, SNL disaster began. And you saw the professionals who were supposed to warn us and keep, keep guard over those kinds of things uh, were participants in stealing and plundering the SNL. And that, now understand this was 13, 14 years ago. The SNL disaster got started in 1981, 1982. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't come full blast to, to attention until about 86 and 87, but that was 10 years ago. So we're really not talking about awful, very recent stuff here. We're talking about stuff that's been around for a few years. Are we talking about the political system following the economic system? that the, uh, the corporations and all spread out across the world and became tightly intermeshed and interlocked. But the political system was still basically national, so now they're changing the political system to accommodate this economic uh, 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 growth well, like that. I think, growth? Frank, that's your book. <laughs> not, not Lash's book, <laughs> but I think it would, it would follow from that. But Lash... Uh, he, he spends very little time on the, the notion of internationalism. Oh, he doesn't? No, he doesn't spend much time on it. He's focusing on what's happening in this country. But these are global people with he, global yeah, experts the elite, running the country. He defines the elite as people who, mm -hmm. who are in that kind of a category. Yeah. But, and I can quote what he, what he calls them, what he says about them. But essentially, uh, he takes that as a given and says, what are they doing to this country? Well, since they are internationalists. They don't care about this country, yeah. and this country is going to hell because of it. But this doesn't seem to be happening in Europe. The United States uh, uh, is a low-wage area now compared to Europe. The wage scale has remained higher, much higher in Europe than here. The benefits are higher in, in Europe than, than uh, the workers have here. Uh, the safety net is better. 
uh, their health programs, national health programs in Europe. You better, you better define Europe when you say <laughs> that. Now, that's all true probably of Germany. Germany, France. But uh, not necessarily of France in all mm -hmm. cases, and certainly not of England, and not of Spain, not and of Portugal, England. and, and uh, Denmark, and it's not necessarily. It may be yeah. true in Sweden. Maybe true in Norway, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not necessarily true of all of Europe. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it, it, this country still is is in in that kind of running in in terms of the level for wages, and those countries are all subject to the same problem, which is internationalization of wages and 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 corporate. They got the same kind of kind of corporation. Germany certainly has the old IG Farben uh, cartels and and criminal corporations still in existence who are still running things over there. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing new about uh, uh, the way Standard Oil and IG Farben cut, cut deals with each other uh, right before the war to screw all the rest of us. But does, it, does this mean that this problem that Lash has is, is, wor is talking about is worse in the United States than uh, some of those more affluent uh, European countries? Well, he... Well, he only talks about he, the United Right. States. He's not dealing... He's not making a comparison. I see. Uh, he's simply saying that, hey, here's what hap is happening in this country. Uh, and here are the details of it, and here's my conception of, of the, some of the pieces of it that, that I see that fit together. Now, when he says that can democracy survive, is he talking about uh, capitalist democracy or bourgeois democracy as we have in the United States oh, where he, the capitalists run things, or is he talking about the concept of democracy where the people are supposedly have a big input and, and rule and control? He's talking about a democratic process which depends on a middle class and the middle class participation for it to function right. And he's talking about the, the decay of the middle class, and he's talking about the failure of the community institutions to provide a basis for democracy. Uh, so he's, he's talking about, in effect, the middle class and the institutions that support the middle class. But mm -hmm. le let me say that this guy is trying to revive the bourgeoisie. He's saying that the bourgeoisie got a bad name. The bourgeois, the, the middle class uh, entrepreneurs especially, uh, got, got a bad name under the Marxists and the, and the rest of those turkeys uh, because they were, were kind of uh, uh, bulwarks of capitalism in a way. Well, th these, these are people that Lash supports because they're a bulwark to corporations. And therefore, he thinks that if we truly had a lot of bourgeois type people in this country, uh, we would be able to offset these corporations and because they are a contrast to it. So he's saying that uh, small businessmen uh, or small business people and uh, small farmers, is this what he's talking about, which should be the uh, bulwark against the well, That was, that uh, was the Jeffersonian ideal. That's exactly yeah. right. It's still true because if you don't have uh, these kind of people in, in great numbers, what you have are wage earners subject to the abuse of the, of the capital system. Which and, and we know that, that with unions going away, uh, these workers are at the mercy of these corporations who have no mercy. You know. Well, this sounds like uh, some, uh, there are some elements of populism here. The man claims to be a populist. The man says that, that uh, the monetary system is, is, is practically, is in the process of ruining us. Everything is becoming monetized and that leaves no values or no culture and it leaves nothing. Uh, and if you try to offset that with state, which we've tried to do, we know it doesn't work well because it's just inefficient and, and corrupt. Therefore, there needs to be a third way, and the third way might very well be some form of, of cooperativeness and populism. That's, hmm. that's what he says. There needs to be a third way. He makes the point. Well, now we have had a populist... Uh revolt, populist party in the United States back uh, decades ago. How does he, is he in outgrowth of this or is, is this something new? He's talking about something new. It's got to develop. Uh, of course, the populist party was co-opted by the Democrats. And a lot of the populist party platform was put into effect as reforms in 1912 under Wilson. The, the uh, Federal Reserve was, was part, of, part of that. It was perverted, of course, uh, because the Democrats uh, let, let the bankers write their own ticket uh, to our disaster, of course, which continues today. But essentially, the ideas of the, the populace, which was everybody with their own dignity, everybody with their own independence, uh, and everybody cooperating with everybody else, uh, that, 
that is a way to offset what's happening and caused by the market and by the corporations and by the state. Well, how would you deal under populism then with uh, big business and the enormous uh, combines which we have? Back in the old days, they had trusts. Now we just have enormous corporations. How would the, how would the populists deal with those? Well, you're asking me now, not Lash. I'm, well, Lash, he we'll say. He, 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 all he says was, the concept of populism is a possibility of a mm. third way between these two unacceptable ways that we've got right now. That's what he's saying. My conception of that would be that if you get people cooperating who are independent and have power, they can dictate politics. But, you know, if, if, if they don't have the money and they can't cooperate enough, the corporations are con going to continue to corrupt and buy the political system as they're doing now. How does, does Lash, talk about, Lash talk about how he could, how we're going to work toward this or how this could be done? Nope, he died too soon. <laughs> he did the easy part, just, he just died point, too soon, right? pointing out the problem. That's, well, hey, <laughs> uh, it, we're overdue to point the problem out that the elite in this country are practically criminal. I mean, we're overdue to, to everybody to accept the fact that these people are only doing what's in their interest and not the rest of us, and they've turned their back on us. And, and the sooner we accept that, the sooner we start working to kick them out of their power. We can't take their money away from them, maybe. We can take their power away from them, maybe. Well, they started out as criminals because they, uh, the uh, ruling class now started out as the robber barons, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the crooks back uh, in those days. So I guess they're, they're just uh, continuing their own thing and going to the next step, which is international. Yeah, but, but there's a difference. Yeah. The robber barons built. The robber barons were railroad magnets. Uh, Rockefeller, who built refineries and distributed gasoline and oil. Uh, other types like that. Even J.P. Morgan, who, who effectively had banks and who, who, who made things run because the government couldn't. Uh, these turkeys we got now aren't making anything work. They just, the Millikans of this world are just ripping us off yeah. and not paying taxes on it uh, even, even at that. <laughs> well, I guess we... Uh need to see if we can get somebody to uh, raise, uh, instead of Lazarus, we'll raise Lash from the dead. So. Well, this guy is a, is a researcher and an academic, or was, and so you would expect him and people that carry on behind him to continue to push for these kinds of things. There is a communitarian movement these days, oh. uh, and the communitarian movement says, hey, we're, we've destroyed our community base. We need to begin to work, to, to make it work, and Grider, if you recall, William, and, uh, who, William Grider. And, yeah. and who will tell the people? That was his solution. His solution was a communitarian approach to things in terms of local uh, communities and local groups taking power away from, from the state and away from the federal government and, and doing it at the local level by, by cooperation. Well, this is what the religious right is doing in city after city and, and state after state then, isn't it? People complain well, about the religious right. No, they're not cooperating with anybody. Uh, all they're doing is, uh, is they found Jesus, and, and, and a few of them are getting together to, to further an agenda they've got, but they're careful not to cooperate. And these are people who do, do not believe in compromise, so they do not believe in cooperation. Uh, they believe, uh, like Torquemada or, or the Catholic Church in the uh, in the old days, if, if you don't have the party line, we're going to put you at the stake. And that's what the religious right believes in, you know, put you up against the wall, you know. Love Jesus or is your act. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting back to the last book, uh, has uh, any notice of this uh, taken place in the uh, uh, establishment press to speak of? Well, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the, the, especially the propaganda side of it, had had one of their hired whores uh, do a piece on it, and, uh, and he did the usual twist, and the twist was beat up on liberals. Oh, well, how, how, how the liberals have anything to oh, do well, with Well, the that? liberals are the cause of all problems. Uh, oh, see, I we see. don't have the communists anymore, so we now have the liberals. <laughs> well, sometimes the liberals deserve some of that, and, and Lash was a liberal until he broke from the whole liberal establishment, meaning the left-wing liberal establishment, mm -hmm. and now he takes off after both the right-wing and the left-wing, and, and uh, I, I think with, with justice in terms of, of both of them seem to have an ideology and neither one of them seem to be willing to really solve the problems. They just seem to be more interested in their own agendas, you know. Well, let's hear it for the populace then. Well, let's, let's see if populism can, 
can uh, break away from some of the nonsense that we hear about it. Uh, but somebody's got to read some history. Yeah. When I make presentations to uh, various classes or various groups, talk to them about the American power structure, it's really rather uh, depressing to them. And so they say, almost inevitably, oh gosh, this is so depressing, what can we do? What can we do? And I say, well, there are a lot of things you can really do. First of all, you can vote. But don't vote for the establishment people. You vote for anybody but the establishment people, but be sure to vote. It doesn't make a difference whether it's a, a, a greenbacker or a progressive or a right winger. Don't vote for the establishment people because you'll get the same old stuff that we've had all these years. It'll send a message to the establishment people that they're going to have to uh, listen to voices other than the own uh, controlling voices, which we hear all the time. Another thing you can do is to join an organization, some type of change or, a, uh, or an organization, and work for some type of change which is compatible with what uh, your interests are. Another thing you can do is take advantage of the call-in programs on television and radio. The uh, uh, call-in people may disagree with you or the uh, announcer may disagree with you and may give you some guff, but then maybe not. But Regardless, at least your voice can be heard. And there's the old bit about writing to Congress people and write to uh, write to the media too. Oh, by the way, there's nothing. There's one thing that will freak the media out to tell them I'm not watching commercials anymore. I'm zapping the commercials when I'm watching on television. I either turn it down, turn the sound down, turn it off. When I'm on the ra when I'm listening to the radio, I turn the radio sound down when it comes to the commercials. <laughs> that'll that'll freak them out. You can appear before your city council and other governmental organizations. And when you do appear in numbers, I can intimidate them and at least make them stop and listen to what you have to say. And maybe you can block something you don't like or promote something you like. But if you have the numbers, it can really help. You can work for alternative candidates. It can be the Socialist Workers Party, it can be Libertarians, it can be whatever. But don't work for the Democrats and Republicans because you're not going to get anything but the same old baloney and establishment crap that you've been getting all these years. And finally, you can do a public access program. And that brings us to the end of another Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on alternative views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas 78713. You must send a self addressed stamped envelope. I'd like to thank some of the people who helped make the program possible. Our crew people, Brian Lynch, Ariel Powell, Susan Millison, Kevin L. West, and Eric Eubank. We also are very appreciative of Actively Radical TV in Sydney, Australia, for sharing with us some of their video and audio footage. Their phone number there is 02 569 1713. And the People's Video Network, who provided us with the information about Haiti. Their number is 212 633 6646. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas 78713. Goodbye.